Truth Espresso, episode 173. Face it, we all would rather sleep in this morning. <sighs> That's why God gave us espresso to kickstart our zombified corpses into hyperdrive. <laughs> And now, giving your mind and soul the morning shot of truth it craves. <sighs> this is Truth Espresso with Daniel Minnick. Well, hey there, friends, family, and lurkers alike. This is your host, Daniel Minnick, hosting Truth Espresso, in particular, an episode of Truth Espresso Express. And this is where I drive to and or from work to talk about whatever topic, off topic, has interested me for the day or something I read from the news. But in this case, it's a little apropos for the Easter season, Resurrection Day. And I want to continue what I talked about last time, last Truth Espresso Express, about transubstantiation. And so the last episode where I talked about transubstantiation got into textual arguments that Catholics use, or those who believe in a physical presence of Christ, mysteriously in the Eucharist, or in the Lord's Supper, or in communion. So we looked at John chapter 6, and then surrounding passages to explain that Jesus was referring to eating and drinking of himself metaphorically. And then the text of the Lord's Supper where Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood, and how there's no necessity in taking that, that it somehow transforms the elements of the supper literally into his body or blood in some kind of undetectable, mysterious way. So now for this episode, I'd like to make some kind of topical points about transubstantiation that I see as problematic when it comes to other aspects about Jesus Christ, his person and his ministry. So first I want to point out eschatological problems because Jesus does kind of make points to his disciples about things to come, about his ministry, and even the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which I think is a problem for transubstantiation. So when it comes to eschatology, we see that Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go away, and they were very sorrowful about that because they didn't understand that they were expecting him that he was there that he was going to eventually overthrow the roman empire be crowned king and set up the kingdom and so he he was there they were going to welcome him and so what was all this about him going away and going to the father and especially as he would tell his disciples that he must be arrested and uh, put to death and three days later rise from the dead like what is that all about But Jesus, in John chapter 6, told his disciples that he would leave the world and go to the Father. So he said, you know, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. Wait a minute, it is expedient for you that I go away. So that means that there is a sense in which bodily, physically present in some physical sense that he must go away. It is expedient for them because he's going to go to the Father. He says, a little while and you will see me not. And then yet a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. So he's saying he's going to go to the Father. You will not see him. And then a little while, you know, in God's timetable, you will see me. But he also explains about sending the Holy Spirit, which he calls another comforter. So Jesus is a comforter, a parakletos to his disciples. And yet he's telling them it is expedient that he goes away. 
and that he will send the Holy Spirit to be another comforter in his place while he goes to the Father. So the Holy Spirit is our comforter on earth while Jesus is in heaven. And Jesus makes it clear in, in John 14. So in John 14 and 16, he talks about, you know, how he has to leave and he'll send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's role. <clears throat> and they sandwich John 15, which is a passage I talked about last time. I am the true vine. So he uses a metaphor there. <laughs> so in John 14... Jesus said that he will pray to the Father and that he will give you another comforter, or basically one who will take his place as a comforter, as a parakletos. So there are specific roles of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that are made clear in the scriptures and what Jesus tells his disciples who will take up the mantle of his ministry while he is gone. He makes this clear, the distinction, the mutual exclusiveness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as another comforter in his place on earth while he is in heaven. When he says, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So in other words, the Holy Spirit must not come unless Jesus departs. So we have the Holy Spirit on earth today, as Jesus says he will reprove the, the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and that the Holy Spirit will speak of him, direct people to him, glorify him while he is in heaven. And uh, Peter also uh, on his first sermon at Pentecost when he says that um, Jesus is the one you know, it wasn't David who's exalted it was Jesus the one who is the heir of the promise that he will not leave his holy one in Hades to see corruption but he's raised him up he's made him he's exalted him as both Lord and Christ so he is by the right hand of God exalted, having received the promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit, which he has shed forth and which you do now see and hear. So Peter tells the, uh, the Jews on Pentecost there that Jesus has indeed executed the promise of the Father to send the Holy Spirit in his absence and so jesus was exalted he was resurrected he ascended to heaven he seated at the father and because of that he sent another comforter he sent the holy spirit which you now see and hear and so there is this eschatology and there is this role that jesus cannot send the Holy Spirit until he departs. So he did depart and he told his disciples a little while and you will not see me. So yes, as long as the Holy Spirit is here on earth and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, reigning, and I would argue until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and then he will return, he will destroy death, he will set up uh, the eternal kingdom, he will usher in the new earth. So regardless of your um, eschatology, you have Jesus Christ in heaven and the Holy Spirit on earth. And Jesus made this very clear with the role and ministry as it pertains to eschatology. So, while the Holy Spirit is on earth and Jesus has departed bodily, glorified, resurrected bodily to be in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father, that, I would say, speaks indirectly to transubstantiation that a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, when he consecrates the host, the bread and the wine, allegedly commanding Christ to come down in a miraculous transubstantiation in which the bread and wine transform in substance but not in accidents, or, you know, if I got that right, the Aristotelian categories in which they explain how the bread and the wine retain properties of bread and wine, but still transform into Christ's body and blood in a way in which our senses cannot detect. 
and I was reading this morning an exchange, which I'll get into a little bit later on another point, but one of the, the Roman Catholic trying to explain why transubstantiation is not guilty of the Christological heresy of monophysitism. Um, he made the point that you don't actually digest Jesus when you eat and, and drink him, that Christ's essence there in the, the elements returns to Christ in heaven, you know, as you digest the bread and the wine. And of course, once again, I have to point out, so all of this nuance, all of this explanation there, that is somehow taking this is my body and this is my blood literally? I would think understanding Jesus' intent to make a metaphor as he did <laughs> in many, many places during his ministry is taking the passage literally and obviously compared to this kind of thing where you have to have this rich and nuanced understanding of transubstantiation and Aristotelian categories of accidents and substances and how what happens when you eat it that you're not really digesting and how it returns and how Jesus is multiplying his body and blood you know in undetectable ways and yeah, all of that, that that somehow is implied by the word is. And I mentioned in the previous episode that is does not necessarily imply becomes or is now or has transformed into. That taking is more literally is a metaphor to show that the bread and the wine of the Passover meal has always pointed to Christ as its fulfillment. And that now, when people partake of the Passover in the New Covenant version, that they're remembering the Christ that it was designed to reflect his crucifixion. So, you have that eschatology and you have that role of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The eschatology that Jesus must go away. It is expedient for you that I go away. And yet a little while, you will not see me. So, if you're looking at the elements of the communion or the Lord's Supper, and you're seeing something that you believe is literally Jesus in some sense then how do you reconcile that with the fact that Jesus said a little while and you will not see me and that then again a little while and you will see me and that you know that's referring to his return that he will come back and return to earth not in transubstantiation but as you know when the disciples saw the ascension the angels said <laughs> Why do you stand here gazing into heaven? The same Jesus that you saw <laughs> ascending into heaven will return in like manner as you saw him go up. He will not return daily in transubstantiation. He will return in the way you saw him go up. And that he is absent physically in heaven via his resurrected glorified body seated at the right hand of the father reigning from heaven until his enemies are put under his feet he will then return to set up the eternal kingdom until then he's not physically on earth now of course being the second person of the trinity having the divine nature co-equal co-eternal with the father and with the presence of god on earth as Jesus told the woman at the well, you know, you go to this mountain to worship, but the, the day will come where true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what we do today in the New Covenant. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't bring him bodily on earth and eat him physically because he is absent in heaven bodily. But he is present on earth spiritually, in the spirit, in, you know, God is spirit, as he says, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So he is present on earth in his divinity, but he is not present on earth in his humanity. And I would say that it is essential to hold that distinction to be jealous over the doctrine of the hypostatic union. And then that's going to be what I get into with my second point, ontology. 
So the human nature of Christ must remain human. I uh, talked about in the superhero series of episodes comparing Jesus to various superheroes about the various heresies in church history, the Christological errors in identifying Jesus. So he is the one person of the Son. You know, the Trinity, you have three persons and one nature or essence, one divine nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three in one nature, three persons, one nature. But then you have Jesus, who is the person of the Son. You have the incarnation. He takes on the human nature. So now with Jesus, you have the one person of the Son with two full and distinct natures united in the person, but not admixed or confused as the Creed of Chalcedon made clear. So his humanity remains humanity, his divinity remains hum divinity, and he is one person with two natures. We don't confuse the two natures. So as Chalcedon says, the distinction between the two natures is not removed via the union, and the natures both remain unchanged in the union. And I remember talking with a, a Roman Catholic, you know, on social media when I was arguing about transubstantiation one time, and I was saying that, you know, with the resurrected Jesus, although he did supernatural things in his resurrected, glorified state, possibly, you know, materializing or going through walls, stuff like that, uh, we don't read anywhere in the gospel accounts where it is in any way obvious that he was in more than one place at once. Because I think that even in his glorified, uh, his resurrected, glorified human nature, that there's still the limitation, even if it could do things like go through walls, you know, that there's uh, um, stuff you can do with at will with the atoms of his human nature, glorified human nature, it still has the limitation that he can't duplicate his human self or be personally, incarnately, in more than one place at once. <laughs> and then this, this Roman Catholic was determined to argue that, you know, I could be wrong. Jesus possibly, in his resurrected state before he ascended to heaven, possibly could have been in more than one place at once. Like, I just don't know that. I can't prove that, that he wasn't, like proving a negative. But you know, it was interesting. He was trying to argue that Jesus could have been, in a sense, omnipresent in his glorified physical form. And I denied that. But the reason he held to that was because we were arguing over transubstantiation. And he wanted to prove or argue that because of the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, that presence in human form was not necessarily a limitation of Christ's resurrected, glorified body. But I presented some of the scriptures that I'm going to kind of allude to here. Now, as I'm driving, I'm not going to provide references, but I'm just going to recall that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, you have the passage of the resurrection, the hope and the promise of the resurrection of the saints in light of the resurrection of Christ. And because of that, the Apostle Paul says that Christ is the first Christ is risen from the dead, and he has, you know, he has become the first fruits of those who died, of those who slept. And what he means by that, because he's talking about our resurrection, he says, you know, if Christ be not risen, our faith is in vain. If Christ is risen, then we're raised. If, if, if we're not raised from the dead, then Christ is not raised. There's a direct correlation there. Because Christ is raised, we all are raised because of that, and in light of that, and he's the first fruits of, of our resurrection, then our resurrection is like his. We will receive a resurrected, glorified body like his. Because he is among humanity, he became incarnate, and the promise given to him to be resurrected and glorified is also for those who are in Christ. 
And then uh, John says in 1 John, he says that, you know, we are the sons of God and it does not appear what we shall be, but we do know that when he shall um, appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. So the what Christ is like in his resurrected glorified state is what we shall be like. So what are the attributes of God and what are the attributes of humanity? Well, one of the attributes is, of God is omnipresence. Omnipresence is a divine attribute, the ability to be anywhere on demand as such or omnipresent. However, we understand that that is not a human attribute. It's a divine attribute. Now, the Roman Catholic will object that transubstantiation is not making the human nature omnipresent because they would appeal to the idea that it's a miracle of Christ. That, so they will say, as I discussed in the, the last episode on this topic, that Jesus had performed the miracle of multiplying the loaves and fishes. So he was multiplying the physical loaves and fishes. And so that that's kind of of what he's talking about when he says in John 6 after uh, after that miracle that when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood that he's performing a similar miracle but only on his own physical body his physical body and his physical blood that he's doing it like multiplying loaves and fishes and so when people partake of the Eucharist the consecrated hosts that they're partaking of a miracle in which Jesus is mul divide, you know, basically multiplying his physical body like the miracle of the loaves and fishes. But of course, it's not quite like that because, you know, it's not like that because Jesus didn't transubstantiate the loaves and the fishes in, you know, they, he didn't transubstantiate something else into loaves and fishes in a way that the senses wouldn't detect. So it's not a similar alleged miracle. As much as the Roman Catholics try to defend the literalness and try to make this similar, it is definitely not similar. People ate of the loaves and fishes physically that were physically multiplied to make more physical loaves and fishes in a way that the senses and the digestion partook and people ate and were physically filled and so when they crossed the river they crossed the sea jesus contrasted <laughs> He said eating and drinking of him, he compared it to coming and believing of him, in him, as I made clear in John 4 with the woman at the well drinking living water, and John 7 where at the Feast of Tabernacles, where Jesus drank, or Jesus said the, that one who comes to drink of him, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. It's clear that Jesus was contrasting what he did in the miracle with the loaves and fishes with people not laying laboring for meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures to everlasting life, the food, and that this food is referring to the meta is a metaphor referring to himself, internalizing himself, eating and drinking of him metaphorically by coming and believing in him. So you know, eternally internalizing him, thereby eternally having possessing eternal life. And so I would say uh, that there's no need for transubstantiation, it is not Jesus multiplying his physical glorified resurrected body like loaves and fishes in the Eucharist as Roman Catholics partake daily or that there's a Eucharist daily all over the world in which Jesus' body is multiplied in an allegedly literal fashion where people are eating and drinking of him literally in a mysterious way but not digesting him and that once you eat, somehow it's you know kind of like um, in Ecclesiastes where it says that the the ruach, the you know, the spirit of man returns to the one who gave him. That somehow Jesus's literal physical essence, there is literal physical substance that is manifested in the bread and wine. 
transubstantiated, then returns to heaven, returns back to Christ, and so he's kind of reverse multiplying it. He's reabsorbing it back in. Like, <laughs> and yeah, once again, so that's taking this is my body literally. There's a much simpler way to understand that. <laughs> and uh, so one time I was arguing with a Roman Catholic uh, on social media about whether transubstantiation violates Chalcedonian orthodoxy and essentially promotes a form of monophysitism by confusing the attributes of divinity and humanity by claiming that you know, on the altar with the Eucharist that it renders Christ body, blood, soul, and divinity on the altar there in the elements, and that that somehow confuses the divine and human natures by attributing divine natures to his human nature in the miracle of transubstantiation. And the Catholic denied it, but I you know, I kept arguing and arguing with him, and any question or challenge he proposed, I kept answering it and asking more questions until eventually he basically had to say, I'm sorry you feel this way. And then I said, yeah, I'm sorry I feel this way too. <laughs> and so I'll leave it at that as I've just parked at work. And so I want to continue this as I drive home to talk about how Trent <laughs> canonized the idea that you could deny the laity and non-celebrating priests that they could receive only the bread and that they would receive the Holy Christ like you could deny the cup to the laity and to non-celebrating priests and that that's not a violation <laughs> of even uh, the claims of the Roman Catholics and then you know, so the next episode, I want to talk about that and the soteriology aspect of how transubstantiation denies the one time sacrifice of Christ soteriologically. Ever wish you could get together with a friend over coffee each week and talk about God's Word? Me too. Hi, I'm Anthony Russo. I'm the host of Grace and Peace Radio. Grace and Peace Radio is a Christian living blog and podcast dedicated to engaging conversations about applying God's Word to everyday life. I hope you'll join me, Anthony Russo, on Grace and Peace Radio each week at graceandpeaceradio.com or right here on the ChristianPodcastCommunity.org. Well, hey there, friends. Daniel Minnick here, and I am back to continue uh, this Truth Espresso Express episode on transubstantiation. And I am headed out of the parking lot uh, where I work and headed back home. So to get my mind going, thinking about what I talked about this morning as I was driving, the before the break of this episode, we were discussing some points about transubstantiation, talked about the eschatological problems with it, particularly Jesus' statements about the future, about his mission, what he will do, that he will leave earth, go to heaven, the Holy Spirit will come, that the disciples will see him no more until he returns, that if he doesn't leave, the Holy Spirit will not come. And then also we talked about uh, ontological arguments. So arguments about the nature of Christ, the human nature of Christ. So we talked a little bit about the incarnation, uh, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, that Jesus is one person with two full and distinct natures that are not confused. And so that we recognize the uniqueness of the divine nature and the uniqueness of the human nature and how neither of them are compromised by the Union. And I've had some conversations with Catholics uh, on social media on the topic of transubstantiation, and I n noticed that one, one uh, guy I talked with, he was trying to claim that because transubstantiation allows for uh, Jesus' human nature albeit resurrected glorified to be in multiple places at once, he tried to argue that it was possible that Jesus, um, prior to his ascension, <laughs> could have been in more than one place at once, basically duplicated and so on. 
And I argued with him that as the scriptures clearly teach that um, we will be like Jesus, that in whatever state the resurrected, glorified human nature of Jesus is, he is the first fruits of our resurrection. And so we, as we see him, we will be like him. And we pointed out that omniscience, or the ability to be in more than one place at once, um, is a property, is an attribute of divinity, not humanity. But this uh, Catholic tried to argue, like, hey, maybe, maybe we will have that ability. <laughs> you know, it's like special pleading because we've got to defend that doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, I want to point out before we move on to soteriology, well, it's kind of tied to soteriology, but with uh, the Council of Trent, remember, this is the council in the 16th century, the 1500s, in response to um, the Reformation that made its doctrinal points against some doctrines that were arising in the Reformation, justification by faith, and even against transubstantiation. So the Council of Trent, with the decrees of its sessions, you know, dogmatized transubstantiation there, but also it was a, a it was a practice around this time because of a lot of superstition about transubstantiation, basically things like it's more likely for, say, the uneducated laity to spill the cup. And if you have superstition about the elements that, you know, if you drop the bread, well, you could pick it up. But if you drop the cup and the juice, the wine soaks into the ground or, you know, gets on the floor and it's difficult to clean up, then what do you do? Because you've uh, defiled the blood of Christ there. And so um, it was uh, a practice at this time to deny the cup to the laity or to the priests who are not currently practicing. But then the question arises, well, if the laity aren't partaking of the cup, and it was uh, Roman Catholic teaching that you must partake of the Eucharist, to receive uh, the grace of Christ in some form, you know, to maintain your standing, your justification there, then are you lacking that grace? You know, you're only partaking of part of Christ. Well, um, Trent made it clear that it was okay to do this because uh, Trent argued that within each of the species, so within the bread itself, and within the wine itself, the whole Christ is contained. So Christ is basically contained in whole. Uh, His body and blood is rendered in whole in the bread alone, and his body and blood is rendered in the wine alone. So wait a minute. So, you know, if you only partake of the bread... You're denied the cup, and yet you still get the whole Christ. Well, then why even bother with the cup at all? Unless somehow it's part of the consecration. Like you can't, you you know, the priest can't consecrate the host unless both uh, elements of the host are there, such that each, both of the elements, like it's, a, it's an all or nothing thing. Like they must both be there to be consecrated, but then each element of the consecration contains all of Christ. So body, soul, blood, and divinity are all rendered in each of the elements themselves and not (laughs) body in the bread and blood in the wine. So we have Trent's declarations and right now with uh, the Roman Catholic churches and their Novus Ordum, the new mass rather than the old Latin mass that was declared uh, through Vatican II, it is now common again for Roman Catholics to, you know, the laity to partake of both elements, especially now that you have, uh, you know, more uh, organized and sophisticated (laughs) handling, I guess, of the elements, and maybe less of some of the medieval superstition. 
But then, if Trent is an ecumenical council according to the Roman Catholic Church, it's not ecumenical proper according to, you know, say what could be considered the whole church, as in East and West, like councils before the East-West split at the beginning of the uh, millennium. But the Roman Catholic Church would consider it ecumenical as far as what they regard to be the true church since the split. And so Trent is a dogmatic council there. So Trent allows for denying the cup to the laity. And then so Roman Catholic apologists have to explain that. Even if transubstantiation were true, how could you reconcile the idea that the whole Christ is contained in the bread alone, based on what Jesus said? Because in John 6, Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, drink his blood, you have no life in you. So then, wouldn't it require that you have to eat bo- both eat the bread and drink the cup? As Jesus himself, he broke the bread, he consecrated the bread, and then he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup, you know, and he says, drink you of it. <laughs> so shouldn't... Um, Everyone who rightly partakes of the New Covenant meal uh, have to partake of both elements? If you're going to take the passages literally, as the Roman Catholics chide uh, Protestants who deny transubstantiation or deny even that the real presence of Christ demands that his body and blood somehow have to be rendered in some physical, mysterious sense, how can you take those passages literally if the bread alone contains Christ's blood? Because Jesus says you have to eat and drink of him. Now, can you drink the bread? (laughs) Is that how Roman Catholics have ever handled the bread? Do they eat some of the bread and then drink the rest of it? But if you're going to say, well, you eat and drink of Christ, the whole Christ, by eating of the bread, well, then I think we start to lose the alleged literalness of Jesus' words, and you can no longer hold to this is my body and this is my blood anymore if when Jesus makes that distinction and yet we have to say today that the bread this is my we have to say of the bread this is my body and blood so if the bread alone is the whole Christ and the wine alone is the whole Christ so much for taking the words of Jesus literally and I'll make the point again (laughs) Understanding that Jesus is using a metaphor is the most literal sense of his words, especially as we consider all this this controversy with transubstantiation. So now let's talk about some of the soteriology of the the Roman Catholic Mass and transubstantiation. That a Roman Catholic, a faithful Roman Catholic, can keep coming to Mass faithfully, can come daily, can come tens of thousands of times, and yet still commit a mortal sin and still have a final eternal fate in hell shows that eating and drinking of Christ, that Christ's one-time sacrifice is not sufficient to sanctify someone unless that person's will be joined to his sacrifice in such a way that Christ's sacrifice has no effect unless that person continues to represent the sacrifice to the Father. And the epistle to the Hebrews multiple times mentions of the one-time sacrifice of Christ. Now, I know that Roman Catholics will explain that, you know, there is only one sacrifice, that Jesus offered his body once. They would agree that there's one true sacrifice. 
because they would say, you know, as some Protestants get confused, some Protestants will will claim that the Roman Catholics are sacrificing Christ on the altar every day. Roman Catholics will say, no, this is not a new sacrifice. This is a representation of the one-time sacrifice of Christ in an unbloody manner. So they say there's only one sacrifice. Christ is not dying uh, again, nor you know, nor is he bleeding again. It's one sacrifice, but it's being represented in every mass. But Hebrews says that by the which will we we are sanctified, we are set apart through the offering of the body of Christ once for all time, once. We are sanctified through that one-time offering of Christ. And it talks about how the, all the priests in the Old Testament would stand daily in the altar, ministering and offering the same sacrifices which could not take away sin. It could never, they could never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, when he had offered one sacrifice, sat down. So what does it mean that Jesus sat down? This is a very clear statement uh, contrasting with the ministry, uh, the requirements of the Old Testament priests. They could not sit down in the holy place while they did the sacrifices. They always had to stand up because their sacrificial duties were never finished. They could go in, they had to perform the sacrifices, and then they had to walk out. And knowing that they would once again come daily, perform the sacrifices while they're standing. But Jesus sat down when he offered his one-time sacrifice. So he sat down to indicate that his priestly function of offering sacrifices was completed by this one sacrifice, a sacrifice for all time. And it was one sacrifice for sins. So what are we to say of this? As John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. What are we to make of the New Covenant argument in the Epistle to the Hebrews, contrasting the sacrifices, plural, of the Old Testament priests with the one-time sacrifice of Christ, if we must continually make representations of that one sacrifice so that each of them are counted as you know a sacrifice to god like in effect it's the same type of thing you must perform this particular ritual for the effects when Jesus was on the cross giving his one-time sacrifice and he said to Telestai it is finished contrasted with the Old Testament sacrifices where the writer to the Hebrew says that the blood of bulls and goats uh, cannot take away sin why because there must be a substitute and Jesus Christ is that one substitute for all humanity who will be sanctified and his sacrifice is sufficient to pay for all the sins of the Saints and as I've argued with Roman Catholics on social media, we can't think of the sacrifice of Christ as some kind of substance type thing, as if he took the substance of it, put it up in a vial so that other humans can dispense it out as needed. No, Christ's sacrifice, you know, I've I've argued that the event itself, the event of Christ's actual sacrifice on the cross itself paid for sins, past, present, and future as pertaining to the forensic justification before God. Now that doesn't mean that our sins don't carry consequences um, that we will have to bear, you know, <laughs> And, you know, break fellowship with each other. And, you know, just as God is our father and we are children, our fellowship can suffer. But the 
blood of Jesus Christ in the actual act of his sacrifice is the actual payment. That event itself is the payment for the acts of sin. It's not something as if you could put it in a vial and then use that vial later on. That's what the sacrifice of Christ is. When he had offered on the cross, when he had offered his sacrifice for sins, it was when he was on the cross and then he went to heaven and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sat down because his priestly ministry is fulfilled. Now he's an advocate. He pleads his blood before the Father. But there are no sacrifices, there is no representation via a ritual such that sins uh, get forgiven in a forensic way by performing a ritual of transubstantiation and that it renders the saving power of Christ that Jesus' sacrifice has its effects in the ritual of transubstantiation. No, we partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. We show his death until he come because his one-time sacrifice has paid for our sins and we as his redeemed people rejoice and we celebrate him. We do that till he come and that's the message that we tell the world that you can be one of his when you put your faith and trust in what he has done in the past on the cross in payment for sins. And so the most important issue with transubstantiation is not heckling over accidents and substances. It's not the issue of metaphor versus literalness and so on. The most important issue with transubstantiation is that by design it denies the completeness, it denies the fi finality of Christ's one-time sacrifice on the cross. It denies the power of it to save and to save completely. And so I'm pulling into my garage and so thank you for listening to this episode of Truth Espresso Express. Thank you for waking up with Truth Espresso. Good morning, and God bless your day. Hey friends, Daniel Minnick here again. If you liked waking up to this episode of Truth Espresso, I would really appreciate it if you would rate it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever application you use to listen to Truth Espresso.